The Way the Lord Has Led Me, or Incidents of Gospel Work, by Charles Stanley. London, G. Morrish, 20 Paternoster Square. Contents Chapter 1. Nothing to Read but the Bible, Trying to Reform, Conversion, Need of Fellowship. First Sermon on John Chapter 3 Verse 16, Early Life, Visit to the Old Butler, Remove to Sheffield, No Advance in Divine Knowledge. Here of the Second Coming of Christ Chapter 2. A Room Open for Preaching. Captain W. Found out our ignorance. Captain W. Charged with error. Testing him with syllogisms proved my own folly. A great change in the current of my course. Visit to those who were gathered round the Lord Jesus. Gathered to the Lord's table, led to read 2 Corinthians chapter 1, but read by another, real guidance of the Spirit, my second start in preaching. God blesses his word, though we are ignorant. Visited many towns chapter 3. A preacher and a man of business. Two cases of my need met by God, God cares for our temporal things. The lost dinner. Led to go where the Lord directs, and found fruit after many years, sent to Scarborough, expenses paid. A collision on the way, met at the terminus, though unknown. Call to preach on a steamer. A sermon, 20 miles long, many saved. Chapter 4. Committing children to the Lord in faith. The lame captain, sent to Scarborough, when there was no one else to preach. The full gospel much needed. The Lord's bag. The work began at York. Preaching at the funeral of a Roman Catholic, lecture on the signs of the times. An after meeting in a cottage. T.S. sent to York, and then W.T. Chapter 5. First visit to Southport, lecture, on the, second coming of the Lord. J.H.'s prayer answered. Good to be afflicted. Went to Wath on Dern. Lydia M. and her house blessed. Preaching at the pottery, and many saved. The railway tracts, other tracts followed. Mephibosheth, especially blessed. The dying shepherd in Australia, victory, on board ship. The Hindu and Mahometan, the dying infidel. Chapter 6. Looking for guidance daily. The bell man at Wooten under edge. Preaching at Landidno. Diagram on the Lord's coming. The revivals. A ton of tracts asked for America. Meetings at Birmingham. Faith answered at Stafford. Meeting at Leamington. Unitarian Lady. Chapter 7. Preaching in London. At John Street Chapel. The Old Prodigal. In the Eastern Counties. Ipswich. Needham Market. Stowmarket. Norwich. Bury St. Edmunds. The Lord's Special Leadings. At Sudbury Chapter 8. Preaching at York. At Bradford and Rochdale. John Chapter 5 Verse 24 and Acts Chapter 13 Verse 38. What more can an anxious soul want early and after meetings? The greatest sinner in Exeter. One blessed at six in the morning. After meetings. Leadings of the Spirit Real. A case in point. Chapter 9. Direct answers to prayer. Led to leads, and preserved from danger. Danger in Sheffield from the Roman Catholics. The Church of Rome in the year 60, the Roman Catholics in Glasgow gladly hear the preaching. Chapter 10. Visit to a village in the Yorkshire Moors, need of faith. Preached at the Moravian settlement at Fulneck. Peace with God, and no condemnation, preaching tour in Yorkshire, call to an old woman blessed. An aged relative chapter 11. Encouragement to young evangelists, the three aged saints, an old man in a grey coat at Bournemouth. One great secret of success in preaching. Servants of Christ, not of men, lectures and preachings in a colliery district. Many helped. Meet for breaking of bread. Decay, scattering chapter 12. Help from a life's experience. Study of the epistle to the Romans, love alone not enough, what God is and what he has done. Dependence on the Holy Spirit, deliverance, searching the scriptures as to the second coming of Christ chapter 13. The church the body of Christ, is this held truth, separation from evil. Guidance from Scripture in Days of Difficulty. The Ministry of John Commended. Dates of the Epistles, Errors in the Church. The Word of God Ashore Guide Chapter 14. How to Walk in Days of Evil. The Word of God, Righteousness of God, Righteousness of Christ and Redemption. In Christ Chapter 1. How wondrously true is that word which the Lord spake to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. The writer of these pages desires for his glory who has shown mercy to him, to record his ways of sovereign grace. As a child I had very little opportunity, but I had a great thirst for books and learning. One day I happened to say, in the presence of a poor woman, how I longed for books, and had nothing to read. What, Charles, she said, there is the word of God on that table, and you have nothing to read. She said no more, but those words could not be forgotten. They were used by the Spirit to show me that I had no heart for God. This, no doubt, came with deeper force as I had, though only twelve years of age, a good knowledge of the letter of the word. 
In those days it was the lesson book in the village school, which I had left about a year, and for which I have ever been thankful. As yet I had no knowledge of my true condition as a lost sinner, and at once set about becoming religious. I tried hard to reform my outward conduct. What surprised me much was this, the more I tried, the worse I became. This went on for some months. There were none in those villages who could point me to the finished work of Christ. All who seemed to have any care for the things of God, were working for salvation. From acquaintance with the letter of Scripture, I was sure there was a peace with God that I could not obtain by all my doings and efforts. After months of struggle and distress, I was returning home one dark rainy night, when the burden on my soul was so great, that I fell down on my face in the road, and cried out, O oh Lord! I can do no more, and a deep sense that I was lost came over my soul. It was there, as I lay in the dark lane alone, that the Spirit of God revealed to my soul the finished work of Christ. Then it was that I saw that which I was vainly trying to do, had been done by my precious substitute on the cross. I do not remember that I saw beyond this, but, like Israel in Egypt, I found shelter and safety beneath the precious blood. And as I rose from the ground, I do not doubt, I was a new creature in Christ Jesus, but though born of the Spirit, how much had I yet to learn as to what the flesh was. When I was converted, I began at once to long for the fellowship of Christians. Fifteen to twenty minutes preaching once a week, was all we got. Nothing could have been more lifeless. Indeed, I do not remember that there were any who attended the village church that knew their sins were forgiven. I attended other preachings a few times, was greatly impressed, and enjoyed their hymns and prayers, but felt their preaching was not the finished work of Christ, through which God had spoken peace to my own soul. I had, moreover, in my conversion and ever since, a deep sense of the sovereignty of God, and I soon felt that this was set aside too much in the preaching. I can see now, that what the new nature longed for, was the fellowship of saints in separation from the world. There was a little meeting begun in the neighborhood, and the preaching was much in keeping with what the Holy Ghost had taught me in that dark lane. There was a gracious work of God, and a good many souls were converted to God. This was at Lawton, in Yorkshire, in the year 1835. In that year, when I was 14 years of age, it so happened that the preacher, one day, failed to come. The Lord then, for the first time, opened my mouth to tell of his wondrous love, to a world lost in sin. I remember the text was John chapter 3 verse 16. In visiting the village more than 40 years after, I happened to call on a man who well remembered the sermon, and the text. It is very interesting to me at this long distance of time, now 53 years ago, to remember that in that first preaching, it was what God is to us, God so loved. It was not. It is not, what we are to God. Oh, if this were the case, I should have been lost a thousand times since then. No, if that were the case, I for one have found, that if my salvation depends on what I have been to God, I am lost forever. In my case, nothing short of an infinite Saviour could have met my sins and need. Here I would just name how God had educated and prepared me, as a vessel of mercy for his future work. Left an orphan at the age of four, I had been brought up by a grandfather, a man of the strictest integrity. I believe I was brought to know the Lord at the time of which I have just spoken. From the age of about seven, I had partly to earn my bread, by working in the fields in summer, and in winter I went to the village school. At the age of eleven, a gentleman took me to his house, and for two years I had the most remarkable instruction from this gentleman. I had little book education, but he made me learn everything that could be learned by observation, the garden, the stables, the duty of the butler, with all this he made me perfectly familiar. One day he would say, Charles, first give thee three hours to catch a crow. Another, he would give me a covey of partridges to bring up. Sometimes he would require an answer at once to a difficult question, such as this, once before company, he asked me, what was the cause of an eclipse of the sun? I replied, if I place my head between this lamp, sir, and your head, you will not see it, just like when the moon is between us and the sun. Amongst other things, I had, at times, to act as chaplain, and read a sermon in the drawing room, and this was done with great solemnity, though a child, when God had begun to work in my soul. It would take up too much space to tell of many interesting particulars, and why and how I left that gentleman. It seems like yesterday since he gave me his long and last address. His last words were, Charles, thou wilt either be a curse or a blessing to mankind. Sure I am, if it had not been for the grace of God, I should have been the former, and if, 
in the least measure, it has been the latter, to God be all the praise. I am quite sure God used this kind man, during these two years, to the benefit of the whole of my afterlife. I left him, and walked over two fields, and then sat down on a stone stile, and wept, and I saw him no more. Thirty years after this, I felt led to go into the neighborhood, to see the aged butler, now with the Lord. We had never met during those years. He said, turning quite pale, how strange, I have just been reading your tract, Mephibosheth, the same which my master gave me before he died, saying to me, Thomas, take this, and keep it. God has shown me by it, that I have been wrong all my life. I thought I had a great deal to do for God. I see it is all the kindness of God, for Christ's sake, and what he has done for me. I am thankful to be able to add, that age Thomas was also brought to the Lord. And to rest in his finished work. After my conversion I removed to Sheffield, then a town of 70 to 80,000 inhabitants. Here I was apprenticed to a gentleman who kept a steel, iron, and general hardware store. He was also a file manufacturer. I thus became acquainted with the Sheffield trade, and all classes of its people. My various occupations had given me a wide acquaintance with human nature. But in those years God was pleased to show me the utter corruption of my own evil nature. It is a terrible lesson, but it must be learned. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwells no good thing, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. This must be learned. The full truthful history of the two natures would be like the history of two distinct persons. The history of the flesh, with its lusts, would not be to the profit of any, to the individual believer, he learns, by its history, that salvation is holy of God. What will be recorded then in the following pages, will be the dealings of God in perfect and amazing grace. In looking back on those years, I am struck with one fact, that is, I made no advance in divine knowledge. I was greatly interested in eloquent preaching, but learned nothing. Indeed, I was in a state of self-satisfaction, and felt as if I knew all there was to be known. In one word, I had no idea of my own ignorance. This was not so in reference to any branch of secular knowledge, but in divine things there was no advance. Indeed, there was the most astonishing ignorance of the true meaning of the word of God. I thought the world, that world which had rejected and killed the Lord Jesus, was rapidly getting better, and that we were the people who would gradually mend it, until it was a converted world. I will now tell how all this self-satisfaction, and delusion, was broken in upon. I should be about twenty-three years of age, and at this time was keeping a little store of material for the Sheffield trades. A neighbor came in one afternoon, looking very serious, and said to me, have you heard the news? No, I said, what news? He replied, there are two men lecturing at the assembly room. And they declare that the world will be at an end, and Christ will come at four o'clock tomorrow morning. I turned round, for I could not keep from laughing. He begged me to go and hear the lecture that night. I went. The lecturer said nothing about the world coming to an end the next morning, but he went over Matthew chapter 24, and showed, from that chapter, the impossibility of the world being converted before the coming of the Lord. Now, though this man held much false doctrine, and probably was not a Christian, yet God was pleased, by this lecture, to awaken in my soul an earnest desire to know the truth as to the Lord's coming again. I was amazed at my own ignorance of scripture, and could scarcely sleep. About eight or ten others were also awakened to inquire. We met at five in the morning, to search the word. We had no idea, either, as to what the church was, or the coming of Christ to take away his saints, but we were occupied with the coming of Christ, to set up the kingdom on earth.